bit scared. Hi guys, today we see about the chessboard killer. The huge network of powerful sewer systems beneath Bitsevsky Park serves all of southern Moscow. It is where many of the dozens of victims of one of Russia's most notorious serial killers ended up. It was not a dignified end for any of them, of course, but when they were hurled alive into one of the sewer's access pits, their plight was even more revolting. They would swim around in the filth, scrabbling for a handhold on the slimy sides, until finally being sucked into the foul labyrinth. The vast, Wooded Park was the preferred killing field of Alexander Pichushkin, who lured his victims there with the promise of a bottle of beer or a shot of vodka. Occasionally, he would suggest a game of chess. And after disposing of each victim, he would return to his nearby apartment and place a coin or vodka bottle stopper on one more square of a chessboard. That is the way the chessboard killer, as Pichushkin came to be known recorded his grisly crimes, attaching a number to another square of the board every time he struck. By the time he was caught, Pichushkin had filled in 62 of the 64 squares. Since his birth on the 9th of April 1974, Alexander Yuryevich Pichushkin had lived with his mother, Natalia, in a typical Soviet-era, high-rise block in the South Moscow suburbs not far from Bitsevsky Park. He never knew his father, who walked out on the family. Natalia Pichushkin charted the beginning of her son's downfall to when he suffered a blow to the head after an accident on a swing at the age of four. He subsequently spent time in an institute for children with special needs and his spelling was badly affected. His mother said he might also have been affected by the sudden death of his grandfather, with whom he also lived. There were suggestions that he was briefly treated in the psychiatric section of a local hospital. Pichushkin's neighbor as a boy, Svetlana Mortyakova, remembers the future serial killer as a pleasant kid, always polite and someone who loved animals. She once found him in tears in the stairwell of the block of flats they shared, speechless with grief over the death of his cat. Whereas most Russians were conscripted into the army at 18, Pichushkin failed the medical. Despite training as a carpenter, he never worked as one. A drink problem meant that the only jobs he could hold down were menial ones, such as supermarket shelf stacking. Yet neighbors insist Pichushkin never became violent. Vodka affects people in different ways, recalled one, but he just became weak and used to collapse at my feet. As a young man, Pichushkin had neither friends nor money and girls didn't like him. He lived an ordinary, boring, everyday life, yet he strove to be different. After his grandfather died, he spent much of his time wandering around Bitsevsky Park, stopping to smoke and drink beer or vodka on the benches under the trees. He was well known to the drunks and itinerants who passed their time there. Until his arrest in the summer of 2006, the 32-year-old spent his working days in a supermarket, his evenings in the park, and his nights at the apartment with his aging mother. Pichushkin had first killed 14 years early, in 1992, when he was just 18 years old, murdering the boyfriend of a neighbor he had fallen in love with. He later killed the girl herself, whose body was found in Bitsevsky Park. Subsequent murders were sporadic but in 2005 the supermarket shelf stacker embarked on a slaying spree. At one stage, Police were uncovering one body every week, most having the serial killer's hallmark of a smashed skull, with the neck of a vodka bottle thrust into the gaping wound. Most of his victims were homeless drifters or drunks. Others were elderly or homeless men who would not have been able to put up much of a defense and whose disappearances went largely unnoticed.
which is how Pachushkin managed to evade capture for many years. Pachushkin would lure his targets to join him in the park with the promise of a drinking session. Occasionally, he would suggest a game of chess or invite them to see the grave of his beloved pet dog. Once in the park's wooded areas, his victims were either strangled or killed with a blow to the skull from a hammer or blunt object. He would always attack from behind in order to stop blood from soaking his clothes, and finally he would stick the neck of a vodka bottle into his victim's skull, ensuring that they did not survive. He could be particularly cruel. The body of one woman was found with tiny stakes hammered into her skull and around her eyes. Seventeen of his prey were left casually on the ground. But most of the bodies were disposed of by dumping them in one of the access pits to the sewers that ran beneath the park, including that of his youngest victim. A homeless boy known only as Mitka, who was just nine years old. This meant that those who were not killed instantly ended their agonies by drowning in the subterranean filth. As many as forty people were believed to have been disposed of in this way while still breathing. According to Moscow police investigator Valerius Hushova, those people who were thrown down into the sewers were, if I can say so, rather lucky, because their deaths were pretty instant. There are such massive water flows and such a huge water pressure that when we tried to put a mannequin inside the sewer to see what it was like down there, it was simply torn apart. One of his victims who survived this ordeal, Maria Verikeva, a shop clerk from Tatarstan, told how Pachushkin lured her into a secluded part of the forest on the premise of showing her some black market goods. Virakeva had met Pachushkin in February 2002 near Kaklovskaya metro station. At the time, she was pregnant, had just split up from her boyfriend and was desperate to make ends meet. She was crying when he approached her and offered to sell her some cameras, which he told her he'd hidden in the park. Pachushkin took her to a remote corner of the park and told her the cameras were in the sewer. He then grabbed her by her hair and pushed her down the eight-meter deep pit. She said she feverishly fumbled about in the walls of the tube and swam around in the mulch for a whole hour before she could grip the side. Despite Virakeva's detailed statement about who her attempted killer was and where he could be found, the local policeman taking her statement asked her to drop her complaint because he didn't want to deal with what he thought was needless work on an unimportant case. The investigation was never pursued and an opportunity was missed to catch the killer much earlier and possibly save more than 20 lives. When Pachushkin was finally arrested four years later, and the connection made with Verikeva's case, the officer who had first interviewed her went on the run and a warrant had to be issued for his arrest. By the time of Pachushkin's capture in 2006, Moscow was in the grip of terror as the death toll mounted. Suspects were regularly picked up, interrogated and released. Initial suspicion fell on the inmates of a psychiatric unit close to Bitsevsky Park. In February 2006, police shot a man in the leg after learning that somebody resembling the suspect had been spotted in the park. He was later released. So too was a transvestite with a hammer in his purse. It transpired that he was carrying it for protection against the mysterious mass murderer. Police finally caught the real killer in June 2006 after discovering that his final victim, his supermarket colleague Marina Moskolaeva, 36, had left a note for her son saying she was going for a walk in the woods with Pachushkin. He denied involvement until detectives produced video surveillance footage of the couple strolling together just before the murder. When he finally confessed, Pachushkin admitted that he even knew of the note his victim had left for her son. But he said flippantly, while we were walking in the park, while we were talking, I just kept thinking kill her or forget it? In the end, 
I decided to risk it. I was, after all, already in the mood. Under arrest, the 32-year-old killer confessed, I like to watch their agony. For me, a life without murder is like a life without food for anyone else. I felt like the father of all these people, since it was I who opened the door for them to another world. He also admitted that killing gave him orgasms. Your first murder is like your first love, he said, you never forget it. And the closer the person is to you, the more pleasant it is to kill him. It's more emotional. A team of doctors at Russia's leading psychiatric institute spent over six months analyzing Pachushkin's background and psychiatric history. One of them, Dr. Yevgeny Makushkin, issued an official statement of the seemingly obvious, Pachushkin wasn't happy in his private life. He just did his job and led a lonely existence. The pattern of behavior that we were witnessing was very complicated. But there was indeed a certain pattern, a striving to murder, and to aggressive sadistic activity. Another psychologist, Mikhail Vinogradov, interpreted the murders as being prompted by anger at Pachushkin's grandfather for abandoning him. There was also a sexual subtext, he said, the killer having described his criminal career as a perpetual orgasm. Psychoanalyst Tatyana Druzernova reported that his love of chess, which ironically he couldn't play, was a clue to his character. She said, Alexander Pachushkin is detached from human beings, who are no more than wooden dolls, like chess pieces to him. One of the mysteries puzzling prosecutors was that the motivations for the slayings were so flimsy. Pachushkin told police he knew maybe 20 of his victims and, under interrogation in 2006, attempted to explain one particular killing, of his neighbor, Valery Kulyasov, because of a row over their dogs. Pachushkin's beloved mongrel had apparently sniffed the pet of Mr. Kulyasov, who shouted, Take away that enormous mongrel mutt! Pachushkin did not forget the insult but waited all of ten years before killing Mr. Kulyasov. In interviews before his trial, Pachushkin stated that he saw himself as a god of the wood. Before he killed, he would listen to his victims' life stories, lecture them about how they should live and then kill them. In his eyes, they were sinners. A journalist who followed the case observed. Since he was arrested, he has always seemed calm and full of self-respect. He even refused to carry on with the trial before all his victims' families were assembled so that he could look into the eyes of every single one of them. He wants glory. However, experts at Moscow's Serbsky Institute, Russia's main psychiatric clinic, declared that Pachushkin was not mentally ill. As his actions were purposeful and he was fully aware of the consequences, he was judged sane and fit to stand trial. Thus, under the gaze of the world's media, the chessboard killer had one last game to play. On the 13th of September 2007, Russia's most prolific murderer went on trial in Moscow accused of causing the deaths of 49 people. It was the culmination of a killing spree that had lasted for over 15 years and had kept an entire city in fear. In a moment of high drama, Moscow prosecutor Yuri Seoman claimed that the accused dreamed of going down in history by surpassing Andrei Chikotilo, the so-called Rostov Ripper who, before the Pachushkin case came to light, was Russia's previously most notorious serial killer. Chikotilo a pedophile who mutilated and ate some of his victims' remains during a 12-year killing spree, was executed in 1994 for the murder of 52 women and children in the southern city of Rostov. Pachushkin had at first attempted to confess to 62 slayings, although prosecutors found sufficient evidence for only 48 charges of murder. 
It was suggested that Kachushkin's bid to surpass Andrei Chikotillo's body count could explain why he had changed his modus operandi from disposing of his victims in the sewers, where they simply disappeared, to leaving them in the open, where they were almost guaranteed to be found. That action would seem to imply that he wanted full credit for what he was doing. Pichushkin had originally told police that he had planned to carry out 64 killings, one for each square on a chessboard. But he later denied this, saying he would have carried on killing indefinitely if he had not been arrested. I never would have stopped, never, he said. They saved a lot of lives by catching me. One of the detectives who had headed the murder investigation watched Pachushkin in the courtroom and commented, it was a real performance for him. He wanted the attention and that was the place where he could it. There was the jury, there was the press, there were the prosecutors and judge, and it was all about him, and he was really pleased about that. He spoke with great pleasure in court about all the things he did. He was really enjoying it. It was Alexander Pachushkin's moment in the limelight and he played it to the full. He was asked if he had any regrets. Pachushkin paused for a minute, and, without an iota of remorse, answered, Yes, I do regret one thing. I regret that you arrested me so early. I was planning to murder another woman in two days' time. Pachushkin was convicted of 48 murders and three counts of attempted murder. With the death penalty no longer in force, he was jailed for life, with the first 15 years in solitary confinement. <laughs>